Hi, and welcome to your module six lecture, where today we'll be talking about the artist Michelangelo. Michelangelo's career is extremely lengthy and very, very prolific, and we know quite a bit about him, so it's very easy that Michelangelo could be his own course. So I will try to be concise today while also showing you a lot of his major works of art, and there are just dozens that are important, so I will try to be focused. So some of the key points that we'll be talking about today is talking about an emphasis on his sculptural works within his body of work as a whole, and also even when he's painting, his use of very sculptural forms. Michelangelo, perhaps above any other artist of the Renaissance, has a very careful study of and interest in the human figure, and we see that throughout his entire career. And as I've already mentioned, he has a very well-documented biography, and so we know quite a bit about his life and the context surrounding his works. So after having read the reading for today, the excerpt from Vasari's Life of Michelangelo, and I do want to emphasize that that is only an excerpt in printed form in English. The biography of Michelangelo by, Vizar by Vasari is 80 pages long. So you know quite a bit about his life already. One thing that's important to know is that he actually was first apprenticed in a painting workshop, which is something that Vasari mentions. He's in the workshop of Domenico Ghirlandaio between 1486 and 1488, and he probably helped in some of Ghirlandaio's executed works in Florence that you can still go see today. In 1489, he went to the Medici Sculpture Garden and trained with the sculptor Bertoldo, who was a student of Donatello. Throughout his life, Michelangelo would claim that he had no teachers and that he trained himself, but we actually know that that is not the case. He stayed in Florence for a good portion of his life, and in his youth, he lived in the Medici household almost as a son, enjoying the humanistic circle, exposed to Neoplatonism and their huge collection of antique gems. He was distraught at the death of Lorenzo the Magnificent, and since he didn't really like his son Piero, who was his, essentially his heir as de facto ruler of the city, Michelangelo left the house at that point. During this time in his youth, he probably did dissections at the Church of Santo Spirito in Florence, although this was highly illegal and considered unethical. We also know that he went to Venice and then to Bologna also before the banishing of the Medici in 1494. So I wanted to show you one of his early works from when he's living in the Medici households. So this work, The Madonna of the Stairs, done between 1489 and 1492, would have been done when Michelangelo was between the ages of 14 and 16 years old. So we can see that from a very early age, he displays his facility with sculpture. This is what we would consider a relief sculpture. It's actually quite low relief. So it's not a freestanding, completely three-dimensional sculpture. Instead, what he's done is cut into the stone around the figures that he wanted to depict in quite low relief. And you can see that it becomes more three-dimensional in the spaces towards us. So here you can see the Christ child and the hand of the Virgin coming out the most from the background. And as it recedes into space, the figures become even more low relief, just hardly picked out even from the background. But you can see his strong interest in dynamic figures and his interest in this beautiful laying of the drapery and the body below it. In the 1490s, Michelangelo actually goes to Rome and begins working for some patrons there. The way that he originally gets called to Rome is that as a youth, he created an antique looking sculpture called a sleeping Cupid. So it was a figure of Cupid asleep. One of his friends saw it and said, hey, you know what, I bet you could pass that off as an antique. And so he buried it in the ground to make it look like it was aged and was actually able to sell it to an antiquities collector in Rome who was so impressed by it that he then had Michelangelo come to Rome and introduced him to several of his friends. However, Michelangelo's fraud was eventually discovered, but that didn't really harm his career very much. One of the earliest works he does in Rome is this figure of Bacchus that I'm showing you. Michelangelo executes this work for a collector, a banker named Jacopo Galli, who was known to have quite a collection of antiquities. And also you can see that even in this contemporary commissions, he's interested in antique subject matter. So we have the Roman god of wine as the largest figure here. He's holding a goblet in his hand. Behind him stands a little fawn, who's his little attendant, and he's eating at the grapes that Bacchus holds in his other hand. 
Now it's a beautifully idealized body type, but notice his stance. Do you see how he's sort of bent a little bit at the waist? He's sort of leaning backwards, his stomach is sticking out, almost as if Bacchus has had too much to drink and he's stumbling just a little bit through space. And the face, which I'm not showing you much of a detail of, definitely shows this vacant, inebriated look. So it's a really dynamic early sculpture that he does when he is only around 21 years old. It is life-size. So we see Michelangelo with this work actually really directly competing with the ancients. This is a trope that comes up again and again in the Renaissance. The best praise that an artist could receive was to be compared to the ancients, to surpass the sculpture of the ancient world. And this was very highly praised. While in Rome, Michelangelo is also commissioned to create this very famous work called the Pietà, and this one is often referred to as the Vatican Pietà because it's in the Vatican, and he completes at least two other versions of this subject. He was commissioned to create this by a French cardinal, and this is one of the earliest Italian renditions of this subject. So Pietà is typically a scene where the Virgin Mary has her dead son in her lap. Now this is something that's not in the Bible. There's no moment in the narrative that says after Christ came off the cross, Mary held him in her lap for a while and contemplated his body. It doesn't really exist. Instead, it's a purely devotional image. It's not really trying to tell a story. It's supposed to move the viewer to pity, which is one translation of this word pieta. The other translation would be piety. This was quite a common northern European subject matter, and here I'm showing you an earlier example made out of wood. They're often made out of wood, and it's a really problematic image to try to construct, because how do you put the body of a full-grown man on the lap of a woman and make it a balanced composition? It's actually really difficult to do. You can see the emotion and the grief on both of their faces, and in this German example you see the almost floral looking wounds on Christ's body that would absolutely move the viewer to pity. So one of the greatest achievements of this work is Michelangelo solved the problem of putting a full grown man on the lap of a smaller woman. So you have this very nice stable pyramidal composition that he's created. He's given Mary this enormous lap, which you really don't notice at first. If you look at this, you think this is a perfectly balanced and rational, logical, composition, but in fact, if she were to stand up, her lap would be just enormous. He also helped solve the problem of propping up Christ's body by putting Mary's foot up on this ledge over on the left side here. Instead of showing a completely grief-stricken mother like you see in the German examples, he shows her in more a contemplative state, looking at the dead body of her son and offering it almost on display for the people. In both figures, you get a really good sense of Michelangelo's interest in anatomy, this perfectly idealized, slender body of Christ, which is a little difficult to see today when you go to see it. Originally, it stood just off the floor, but now it's quite a bit higher and behind bulletproof glass. There was some criticism leveled at Michelangelo after he executed this work. Most people said that the Virgin Mary looked far too young to be the mother of a 33-year-old Christ. And in fact, she does look really young. However, his defenders said that the reason she looked so young was because she was completely pure. She remained a virgin her entire life. And that resulted in her not really aging at all. But you can see the very delicate rendering of her facial features. She's this beautiful, beautiful face. And he uses his exquisite skill in carving to really render a lot of modeling possible through the way that light falls on this. I want to show you a detail here of Christ's arm lying across the drapery of his mother. You can see the really careful attention to the musculature, how the actual system of the body works. You can really get a sense that Michelangelo was working from the skeleton outwards, so the, the arm bones and then layered on top of that are the muscles and the veins which emerge here, and then finally on top of that is skin. And he uses, he really fully exploits the marble in order to create this really impressive virtuosic display. This was originally intended to be displayed in the church of old St. Peter's before Bramante starts renovating the structure. 
and it was in a burial chapel for this French cardinal. Now there's one fun story attached to this work of art, and that is Michelangelo one day was in old St. Peter's, and he wanted to hear what people were saying about his work, so he went and stood behind a group of people who were just raving over it, thought it was incredible, and somebody said, well, who made it? And somebody said, it's our Gobo from Milan, the name of the sculptor Gobo. And Michelangelo was so distraught at that, that he wasn't getting credit for his work, that he hid in the basilica overnight and carved his signature into this band that crosses the Virgin's chest right here. It seems to hold her drapery in place. And it says, Michelangelo's Buonaratus Fiorentinus Fecit, who's making this. Michelangelo Buonarotti from Florence is making this. And it's interesting that he uses that verb tense, is making, so that it shows like it's in process, that it's not finished. And he doesn't even complete that word fecit. He doesn't let that T go. So it's like it's always in the process of being made, which is a really interesting sort of commentary on the work of the artist. Now, we don't know if this story is actually true. It doesn't really make a lot of sense because this band otherwise serves no purpose. It's really doing nothing here and seems almost purpose-built to hold his signature, and this is his only signed work of art. In 1495, Michelangelo returns to Florence from Rome, and it's a radically different place when he returns to his native city. The Medici are ousted officially in late 1494, with Piero, who was nicknamed the Unfortunate, allying himself with anyone who wanted entry into Florence. The city fell under the spell of the Dominican preacher Savonarola, who I talked about when we were discussing Botticelli. After the Medici were thrown out of the city, they started a popular parliament that they called the Grand Council, which created a stronger republic than had been with the Medici. Michelangelo, shortly thereafter, shortly after returning to Florence, enters a competition to carve a huge chunk of stone it was meant to be this, a statue of a prophet for the cathedral buttress. This was a stone that had been worked on by two previous sculptors, a couple of generations older than Michelangelo, and had just been sitting in the fabrica in the building workshop of the Duomo complex, waiting for something to happen to it. Nobody had been able to work it, and it was this very shallow block that caused a lot of problems. They had even named it as a David before, Michelangelo won this composition. They were going to give it to another sculptor and architect who wanted to add marble to it, but Michelangelo was consulted and he gave and they gave him the commission after he said that he wouldn't need to add any stone to it. Here I'm showing you a drawing for the figure of David. We can see this arm here and this figure of David standing triumphantly over the head of Goliath, which is actually quite a different conception than what he ended up doing in the end. Here is the final work, one of the most famous works of art in the world. What we have is the biblical figure of David. And David was later King David, but at this point in time, we're understanding David as this shepherd boy who was the only one brave enough to face the giant Goliath in head-to-head -head combat. Michelangelo's David is an image of a male nude that is both realistic and idealistic. The nudity of the figure in fact suggests a Hercules rather than a David. And if you think about this compared to Donatello's, for example, well, Donatello's is also nude, but remember that it could be interpreted as a Mercury. This figure could also be interpreted as Hercules, which was another of the symbols of the city of Florence. From this angle, you can see just how shallow the block of marble was that Michelangelo had to be working with. So if I go back for just a moment, here you see the long stance of the figure. He's in this very nice contrapposto position. He's got his left leg really flung out pretty far, which is interesting and a little out of proportion, but it's likely because that was the way the block was positioned, that there was a vein in the marble or something that he was working around. You have this branch in the background acting as a strut. That is what's keeping this enormous marble work of art standing upright because marble is actually a really weak medium. It's very, very heavy and has trouble supporting much weight. And so if it would be this thin to support the entire thing, it would have been really problematic. And in fact, the museum that this is in in Florence is constantly monitoring the base and the sculpture itself to make sure it doesn't collapse.
on itself. So the commission for this stipulated that the work would eventually be put up on a buttress of the Duomo. And so it's made into a colossal figure. This thing is like 14 feet high, just massive, massive sculpture. And there's a couple of features that seem slightly out of proportion, but if you start thinking about how it's supposed to be hoisted up you know, 70 feet in the air, they make a bit more sense. So for example, his hands are shown as just huge, just absolutely massive. And his head is the same way. He has this huge mop of hair that I think you can see quite a bit better in this photo, for example. And it seems that Michelangelo is thinking about where the original placement would have been. However, it was so highly celebrated after it was finished, they weren't sure that they actually wanted to put it on the cathedral. Instead, they seem to have wanted to adopt it as the civic symbol of the city. They ended up convening a council to debate where it should be placed, and on this council were people like Leonardo da Vinci and Botticelli who were able to help decide where it would eventually be placed. We have the minutes for that meeting. It's actually really fascinating to read. Eventually, they decide to put it in front of the Palazzo della Signoria, the city hall, and they place it right next to the door so that it's facing south, looking towards Rome. And remember, I've mentioned before that Florence has some tension with Rome, and so that makes nice good sense that this defender of the city, this underdog who eventually overcomes Goliath, would be looking towards an enemy. So it became this important symbol of civic pride rather than be put on the cathedral as had been originally planned. I wanted to just show you a detail of the face for a minute to give you a, a better sense of what his facial expression looks like. And if you see this from the front, you really don't get a sense of this sort of nervous expression that he's displaying. So Michelangelo has carved this really heavy brow and he's furrowed it. You can see the eyebrows knit together. The eyes look towards the enemy as he's preparing to go to battle. So he's got a sling on his shoulder and in his other hand is the stone. But he actually looks a bit anxious about this fight. Even though he is shown as this heroic nude, Michelangelo still is thinking about the psychological implications what this would mean for this figure of David. Now anybody who would see Michelangelo's work would also know Donatello's. So I'm just reminding you what that looks like again. Here Donatello is showing David as this triumphant youth. So we've got quite a few differences going on between Donatello's work, bronze, closer to life size, David is shown after the battle with the head of Goliath already cut off at his feet. There was another very well-known David produced after Donatello's. That is by Andrea del Verrocchio. And remember, Verrocchio is the teacher of Leonardo da Vinci. Here we've got a work that follows Donatello's model quite closely, although notice he is clothed here. And interestingly, the head of Goliath is shown over to the side, so that instead of looking down towards the head, as Donatello's figure did, he looks out sort of triumphantly towards an audience. Michelangelo's is a significant departure from these earlier models, which all Florentine citizens would have known. We have this heroic marble nude. He has the perfect body, and he is shown much older than the teenage David that would have done the actual fighting according to the biblical story. But it's all about the heroism of this figure, according to Michelangelo. And remember, I've talked about how interested he is in anatomy that extends throughout the entirety of the figure. You can see it in the musculature, you can see it in the tendons of the neck, and then one of my favorite details here, which really is a great example of what the Renaissance is all about, is Michelangelo is even thinking about how the vein, the systems of the body works. So for example, the hand down to his side, right here, his right hand, which is holding a stone next to him. If you look at the veins of the hand, they're all completely engorged because if you hold your hand down below your heart, it fills with blood. Whereas this arm at rest, holding the sling up here, the veins are conceived in a really different way because there's not as much blood in them. And so you really get a sense that Michelangelo knows the human figure intimately. He's very familiar with the structural systems of the body and he puts that into his art. I wanted to show you a Florentine example of Michelangelo's painting, and this work is referred to as the Donitondo, dating to about 1503. This is done for Agnolo Doni, and we see this very interesting composition of 
the Holy Family. So we see Joseph in the background, the Virgin Mary seated in front of him, and then the Christ child sort of coming off of Joseph's lap over his mother's shoulder while he plays in her hair. They're sitting on and in front of this low wall. And then right behind the wall, you see a little St. John the Baptist, who we've seen so many times before. And then this series of nude figures that have really eluded interpretation by art historians. Are they supposed to be angels? Are they supposed to be Neoplatonic ideals? It's really not very clear. You see this significant contortion of the Virgin Mary, and at first it might look fairly normal, but if you think about what that pose would mean, if you try to sit in that pose, it's a bit more complicated. See how her toes stick out here? It's hard to know exactly where her leg is, this turning towards the Christ child. So it's a sort of pyramidal composition, but this torsion gives it this variety that we haven't seen in something like Leonardo da Vinci's work, for example. You can see even in his painting, remember he trains as a painter first, his forms are quite sculptural and his use of color is quite cool. So he doesn't like a lot of blacks in his colors. He seems to prefer the highlights to making really dark shadows by adding black to his paint. And I just wanted to compare for just a moment Leonardo's conception of the Madonna and Child with St. Anne and John in the Burlington House cartoon with Michelangelo's Donitondo. And remember this tondo refers to the round form here. But you can see that he's working with some similar issues that Leonardo was exploring in his compositions. But I think that even though we're comparing two different media here, drawing versus painting, you can also see the really different approach to painting that you have between these two artists. Even in his drawings, Leonardo uses that sfumato technique considerably and Michelangelo, he does use quite a bit of modeling, but he's not using the smoky effect in order to blur the lines. Michelangelo's next major commission was also in Florence for the Palazzo della Signoria for the City Hall. So remember I mentioned that Leonardo was commissioned at the same time as Michelangelo to create a full wall fresco showing a different battle scene from Florentine history. And Michelangelo's here is called the Battle of Cascina. And I'm showing you again a copy after Michelangelo's original cartoon because it was so steady that it eventually seems to disintegrate. Again, we see a direct competition between Leonardo and Michelangelo. And Michelangelo absolutely seems to have felt this according to his, biogra according to his biographers. The council of the city wanted the best works creatively and for there to be a speedy finish. So it makes sense to pit the two artists against each other. Michelangelo really disliked Leonardo, who had a bigger reputation than him at the time, and Michelangelo desperately wanted his work to be better. We see very different approaches to this commission. Michelangelo's drawing is in many ways indebted to Leonardo and his works, but we see a greater interest here on the human body. So the story of this battle scene is that right before the Battle of Kashina, the soldiers in this battalion were all relaxing and bathing and then their commanders in order to test them sounded the battle cry and so we see in this happening all of the soldiers jumping out of the water in various states of undress trying to get ready for bat for battle as quickly as possible it becomes this school almost of different positions and forms that figures might take michelangelo's preliminary sketches rather than showing this moment show cavalry, so soldiers on horseback, in battle. So you can see that he really changed his conception, perhaps to compete even more explicitly with Leonardo. So not a same subject, but showing what he is actually really skilled at, and that is showing the musculature of the human form and his ability to show all of these different postures and different states of their mindsets. Just to remind you what Leonardo's work looked like, you have a really different emphasis here than what you had in Michelangelo. So there's a sense of frenzy in both of these, and there's a torsion in both of these as well, with lots of turning figures, but there's a bit more chaos because this is an actual battle. Whereas with Michelangelo's, you see this emphasis on the human form. Michelangelo's can actually be considered less naturalistic because they almost feel like they're all posed very carefully. And here I'm showing you just a single 
figure study for the Battle of Kashina, but you can really get a sense that Michelangelo composed each figure separately and then put them all together, trying to create a harmonious composition overall. Each figure is a concrete study of anatomy. Following his work on the battle painting, Michelangelo is called to Rome by Pope Julius II. It's not clear exactly why, and there's a number of connections that exist between them. Julius was quite formidable. He was autocratic and interested in expanding the territories of the papacy. When he was trying to drive the French out of Italy in 1511 and 1512, he rode into battle in armor at the age of 68. He was also a very well-known patron of the arts. We've already talked about him in relationship to Bramante, and here I'm showing you one of his major commissions, that is of the Belvedere Courtyard. He also initiated the rebuilding of St. Peter's, as we discussed before. Michelangelo's first major project that he does for Julius II is basically his dream project. He's commissioned by Julius to create a monumental tomb. And some people say that the reason that Julius II wanted New St. Peter's rebuilt was to create a better location for this monumental tomb. Michelangelo is given free reign to design as elaborate and lavish a tomb as possible. And as I'll talk about through this, throughout this lecture, it doesn't quite come to fruition the way he hopes. But this is one reconstruction of what the tomb project was looking like around 1505. Michelangelo began designing the tomb, ordering marble, and designed like mad, and was kept under a retainer by Julius II. He envisioned something like 40 life-size figures in this monumental architectural framework, so you would have been able to enter the tomb through this doorway here, and you can see the huge sarcophagus at the very top. Eventually, there's so much confusion regarding his payment, which Vasari talks about, that Michelangelo flees the city and goes to Florence. There's differing accounts as to why, but both Julius II and Michelangelo are both so volatile, it's incredible that anything got accomplished at all. When Michelangelo returned to Rome, and Julius II did as well, he decided to have him stop working on the tomb, and instead commissions him to paint the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Now, Julius II was the nephew of Pope Sixtus IV, who had commissioned the building of the chapel, and the series of paintings that ran along this central register depicting scenes from the life of Christ on one side and scenes from the life of Moses on the other. During Sixtus IV's lifetime, you also see the execution of the series of sainted popes standing around here. Now, Michelangelo wanted nothing to do with this. He said he wanted to work on the tomb. He said that he was not a painter. And Julius wanted him to do both, work on the tomb while also working on the ceiling. So the Sistine Chapel was the Pope's private chapel, and Julius' commissioning of the ceiling frescoes was his moment to make his own mark on the chapel that his uncle built, but also this chapel is really important because it's also the site of conclaves where new popes are elected. It stands between the Papal Palace and Old St. Peter's, and again is the Pope's private chapel. The content of the frescoes, especially under Sixtus IV, is all about the sovereignty of the Pope. With the life of Moses, you have the idea of the priest as a lawgiver, and with Christ, you have the establishment of the papacy. I want to just talk about the program very briefly because there's so much going on here. I could easily talk about this for hours. Originally, Michelangelo was supposed to paint the 12 apostles seated in these spandrels where you now see these large seated figures of prophets and sibyls. It seems that Michelangelo was able to convince Julius II to change his mind, and instead Michelangelo was able to paint what we see today. Here's the ceiling as a whole. It's, all, it's very hard to get photos of this. You can see this is actually scanned from a book. The central component of this are these nine narrative scenes with different stories from the book of Genesis. And there's three groups of three. On this end right here, we have three stories from God's creation, where he's separating the light from the darkness, creating the sun and the moon, and then separating the waters as well. The next series is the creation of Adam, Eve, and then their temptation and fall. And finally, you have three scenes from the story of Noah. That is the sacrifice of Noah, the flood, and the drunkenness of Noah. And then there's a lot of other things going on as well. I already mentioned these seated figures are prophets and sibyls, and sibyls are female counterparts. They were 
the pagan women who were said to have foretold the coming of Christ to the non-Jewish populations. You also see in the spandrels here in these triangular shapes and then also in the lunettes below them right above the windows, the ancestors of Christ, and they're all nicely labeled for us. And that is showing the descent from the Old Testament to the life of Christ, which is on the lower part of the wall. And then very famous figures, you see all of these nude male forms surrounding the narrative scenes. They're all holding up these garlands of oak leaves, which was a personal emblem of Julius II, and then these fictive bronze medallions. These are referred to as the Inudi, the nudes. And again, it just seems to be Michelangelo's interest in the human form, especially the male nude. Here we have the most famous scene of all, the creation of Adam. There's lots of different interpretations of this work, but I want to just give you a basic overview. This is right in the center of the chapel, and it's quite iconic for a lot of reasons. One being that it is in the center of the chapel, but also because it's one of the most dynamic works here, and it's got a lot of symbolic meaning. So on the left side, you see this lethargic Adam reclining like an ancient river god statue, very much classicizing here. He's reclining on the earth, and God, the Father, has streamed in with his entourage of angels and is about to touch his finger and give him the spark of life. So this is the moment right before Adam is bestowed with wisdom and is able to come alive. I want to just show you some details of these inudi, these nude figures. They're all in different positions, sort of a repertoire of Michelangelo's ability to show the nude body, very much like his Battle of Kashina cartoon. You can see his significant modeling that he uses, these very bright highlights and very dark darks. You can also see the outlining of the figures here because in most cases in the ceiling, he's working from full-scale cartoons that are transferred, so you've got a bit of a harsher outline than in a lot of his other works of art. Michelangelo worked on the Sistine Chapel ceiling for four years. He did take about a nine-month break at one point when Julius II couldn't pay him for a while. We know that it really negatively affected his body, and we know this especially from a poem that he wrote during this period. He was actually a very prolific poet, and we see him here depicted on the side, shown standing, painting on a ceiling. He didn't lie on his back like is commonly thought. So here we have the English translation of this. I've got myself a goiter from the strain, as water gives the cats in Lombardy, or maybe it is in some other country. My belly's pushed up my belly's pushed by force from beneath my chin. My beard toward heaven, I feel the back of my brain upon my neck. I grow the breast of a harpy. My brush above my face continually makes it a splendid floor by dripping down. My loins have penetrated to my paunch. My rump's a crupper as a counterweight, and pointless the unseeing steps I go. In front of me my skin is being stretched while, if, while it folds up behind and forms a knot, and I'm bending like a Syrian bow. My painting is dead. Defend it for me, Giovanni, and my honor. I am not in a good place. I am not a painter. So he's still so very adamant that he is not a painter. Following the death of Julius II, you have the election of the first Medici Pope, Leo X. And so we see a dramatic change in the conception of the tomb of Julius II. So this is his 1505 version. In 1513, when Michelangelo starts working for the Medici Pope, we see a significantly scaled down conception. So instead of this large freestanding form, we have what is probably intended to be attached against a wall. You see the high part over here, and then several life-sized sculptural forms as well, a change in where the sarcophagus would go, and then a reclining image of the Pope would have been on top. And in this reconstruction, you can see that Whoever's put this together has included some of the executed sculptures that are not, well, these two down here are in the Louvre rather than as part of the tomb, but this figure of Moses here is in Rome in the finished version of Julius II's tomb. Here is that figure of Moses. It's a very dynamic, large, hulking figure. You see Moses turned, looking away from the viewer, his hands caught in his beard. Under his arms are the tablets of the law, and he's got these two horns on his head, and you actually often see Moses depicted in this way. In the Bible, it says that he had two points of light on his head, and often this gets mistranslated as horns, which is why you see it 
as such in Michelangelo's sculpture, sculpture, but this is just the most dynamic and engaging of the figures that Michelangelo eventually does get to do for the tomb of Julius II because he's forced to abandon this project since other patrons want him to work for him. Michelangelo does return to Florence starting in the 15 teens and 1520s because the Medici popes actually wanted him to work on projects for them in Florence rather than in Rome. And what I'm showing you here is referred to as the new sacristy or the Medici chapel in San Lorenzo. And here we see Michelangelo designing an entire architectural work which is rather classicizing in its design, but it really puts a spin on typical classical ideals. The point of the creation of this chapel was to create grander tombs for Lorenzo the Magnificent and his brother Giuliano, but instead this ends up glorifying two lesser-known Medicis who were both Grand Dukes of Tuscany, so after the Medici gain the papal throne, they actually stop this de facto nonsense as rulers of Florence and they established themselves as the Dukes of Tuscany. I wanted to just show you a few details here. We see Giuliano de' Medici's turn towards not the altar but instead the sculpture of the Virgin Mary that stood at the other side. Each tomb is conceived in a very similar way showing the Medici Duke in full armor set into a small niche surrounded by a six a significant architectural framework that is following some classical ideals but doesn't follow normal proportional systems and there are some very strange things going on. Below him and below the other duke as well are two reclining figures seated on top of the sarcophagi. Now they look sort of like they're sliding off but this wasn't Michelangelo's original conception of the works. Here I'm showing you the other Medici duke also looking towards the Madonna. Here he's more contemplative, whereas his counterpart on the other side, Giuliano, is more active. And here you have two other figures. So on each tomb you have figures of night and day. And then on this side we see dawn and dusk paired to each other. Again, this is related to the active versus the contemplative way. Now originally Michelangelo designed the tombs to be much grander, to include sculpture even on the floor, but like many of his projects, he actually leaves it unfinished at the time that he leaves Florence. Vasari is actually the one who comes in and sets it up the way we see it today. So in this sort of reconstruction, you can get a sense of what the tomb should have looked like. The figures wouldn't have looked quite like they were sliding off the sarcophagi as they do today. While working at San Lorenzo, Michelangelo also works on this addition to the cloister area, he creates a reading room for what's called the Laurentian Library, named for Lorenzo the Church. He also creates this massive vestibule and huge, very weird staircase leading into it. This room is also classicizing in some of its designs. You can see in the, you know, the, the columns and pilasters that are being used and the pediments, the edicules surrounding these niches, but there's some very weird things going on here, like the empty niches, like the empty panels up above them, like the corbels that are supporting these columns recessed into the wall. Rather anti-classical, but Michelangelo can kind of do whatever he wants, so there's a lot of architectural experimentation in his work. In this view, you can see that the staircase occupies basically the entire room, but he had to have some kind of stairwell leading from the, the entrance to the reading room, which was up on a higher level over the monk's cell of San Lorenzo. These stairs are very sculptural, so you've got these rounded stairs in the center. By contrast, you have these rectilinear ones on the exterior here. You see these balustrades delineating the separate parts. It's not an extremely functional staircase, though, because you have to make these weird turns if you're coming up from the outer sides here, and it's just, it's, it's just weird. So this is also left unfinished after Michelangelo leaves Florence. So it's difficult to tell exactly what his designs are. And here I'm showing you what the reading room itself looks like. You can see the continuity between the staircase, which is now behind us in this view, and then the walls here. You can see using the same white plaster with this gray Pietras Arena, which is very typical of Florence. The tomb of Julius II keeps getting put on the back burner as new patrons want Michelangelo to work for them. So here's a 1532 version, even more reduced in scale and conception than what we saw before. This version comes around the time that Pope Paul III commissions Michelangelo to create 
another work in the Sistine Chapel. There's a famous story that goes that Michelangelo pleaded not to have to execute the commission for Paul III because he was still working on the tomb of Julius. And Paul is supposed to have said, I've had this in mind for 30 years already, and now that I'm Pope, I can't have it. So like the Medici before him, he made him he made Michelangelo put the tomb aside to work for him. And I just wanted to show you a couple of the unfinished sculptures that Michelangelo executes for the tomb project that if you go to see the David in Florence, these are actually kept in the same room as the David. You can really get a sense of how Michelangelo works when he's sculpting, letting the figures emerge. Talking, He talked about it as if he were liberating them from the stone, and I think you can get a very good sense of that. So the work that we'll look at now is on the altar wall of the Sistine Chapel, and it's called The Last Judgment. It's the huge painting you see over the altar. Here it is as a whole, and Michelangelo completes this between 1536 and 1541. In many ways, this work can be seen as a response to the sack of Rome in 1527, where the city was sacked by imperial troops. Many people were killed, including priests and nuns. Relics were thrown into the streets, and many and much of the papal treasury was completely despoiled. And it also can be connected with the tenuous nature of the church on earth, especially in relationship to the effects of the Protestant Reformation. This painting upset the coherence of the chapel's decoration, destroyed a frescoed assumption of the Virgin by Perugino, and even some of Michelangelo's works, especially up in these lunettes up at the top. So when he was doing the Sistine ceiling, there were paintings of his there. This work became quite controversial for a number of reasons. So we've looked at a Last Judgment scene before with Giotto's work in the Arena Chapel. You'll have to recall that I didn't include it in today's lecture, but you might remember that it's very carefully balanced between how many saved there are versus how many damned there are. Now Michelangelo set it up in a similar way so that in the lower left you see the elect, some rising out of their graves and ascending towards him, where Christ looks down to the right in this one sector of hell. So there's really not very much hell going on here, just this little area. Then you have the angels calling all the souls. All around at the top you see quite a few saints and various other unidentified figures who are surely part of the elect. And then all of these saved here. So the balance is a little bit off. It's not so neatly organized. In fact, standing in the Sistine Chapel, you get this really great swirling effect, like the whole thing is in motion. Also, the excess of nudity did not conform to the current status of the church, which was in the midst of its own reform, was trying to fix some of its own problems internally. And there was talk of it being whitewashed, of this painting being whitewashed for its nudity. Finally, one of the other issues that it was that it included some elements of secular culture, that is from the works of Dante, which wasn't seen as appropriate. So there's two figures in particular that are from Dante, and in this detail we can see both of them. Here you see the oarsman who's about to beat people out of his boat. This is Charon, who's talked about in Dante, but also in pagan mythology. He was the one who rowed the dead souls across the river Styx. And then also this figure right here is from Dante. This is King Minos, who is the judge of the underworld. You can see this snake biting onto his genitals and wrapped around his body. Well, according to Dante, however many times his snake wrapped around his body, that was the circle of hell that you had to go to. Here is just a detail of Christ at the very center and the Virgin Mary, who is curled up towards him. You can see a significant change in the way that Michelangelo represents the new body, especially compared with what's going on in the Sistine Chapel ceiling, which predates this by 30 years. Christ here is a much more solid mass and even seems to have some muscles that don't really even exist. So it's Michelangelo adapting his presentation of the new form. There's a number of identifiable saints throughout, and art historians have determined that most of the saints shown are those who underwent horrible bodily tortures at the time of their martyrdom. So for example, you see San Lorenzo, St. Lawrence seated right here below Christ, holding what looks like a ladder but is meant to be a grate. That's because he was slow roasted alive. Next to him here on this cloud is St. Bartholomew, who holds this skin in his hand, and Bartholomew's torture and execution method was to be flayed alive. 
And then here you also see a couple of other notable saints, St. Saint Blaise holding these combs, and then St. Catherine of Alexandria, whose attribute is this spiked wheel that she was crushed over. Now, one thing that happened right after Michelangelo died is this controversy about the nudity in the chapel was approached head on. And they had one of his friends, not exactly a student per se, but somebody who worked closely with him, Daniele da Volterra, come in and paint loincloths over the most egregiously nude figures. So all of these draperies that you see covering the genitals of all of these figures, those are added later. Michelangelo had all of these figures nude. All of these fresco elements were added dry on top of it so that it could be removed at some point if they wanted to, except for two figures, and that is St. Blaise and St. Catherine here. Originally, Catherine and Blaise were both shown nude, and Blaise did not originally look towards Christ. Instead, he looked down towards Catherine. So imagine if these two figures were nude, what that would look like exactly. So these two were painted in true fresco, so completely demolishing Michelangelo's earlier work. Michelangelo also becomes one of the architect of St. Peter's, and he actually works as the architect of St. Peter's under five different popes. A troublesome position to have because no one could be made happy, and yet it was a very high honor. His predecessors on the task were often not his friends, although he maintained some elements of their design. And I'm showing you here a comparison between Bramante's plan for St. Peter's on the left and then Michelangelo's readaptation of that centrally planned design, which he actually makes quite a bit more dynamic. He enlarges the piers pretty considerably to support the massive dome that he then was designing and that can be attributed to him pretty solidly. Many of his additions were concerned with structural support, because remember, Bramante has issues with foundations sometimes. Michelangelo did favor the centrally planned building. It went back and forth between the architects who worked on St. Peter's about if it should be longitudinal or centrally planned. And he also wanted a hemispherical dome marking the site of Peter's burial. Here I'm showing you the dome as executed, only varied a little bit from Michelangelo's original design. You can see this almost sculptural form to the exterior of the dome. And here I'm showing you a print of what Michelangelo's entire project would have looked like if executed. So on the right side, you can see the portico, the porch with freestanding columns. He unified both the interior and the exterior with giant order Corinthian pilasters. So these are these flat columns right up against the wall, going more than one story. That's why we refer to as the giant order. Most of his work was completed after his death, but there were modifications made to many of his plans in the late 16th and the early 17th century. Under Paul III, Michelangelo also works on the urban fabric of the city, and this print I'm showing you here is after Michelangelo's designs for the Campidoglio, that is the major piazza that's on the Capitoline Hill. The Capitoline Hill was the center of civic government in the city. And technically, Paul III wasn't the patron, but it's an excellent example of how much influence the Pope wielded over the city of Rome. In spite of the Senate and civic government, and this being their site, the Pope was essentially in charge. So this was an important site in ancient Rome. It was the site of the major temple to Jupiter, the head god. And in the Middle Ages, this is where the Senate started meeting in the civic government of Rome. Michelangelo's entire design is based around the framing of this equestrian statue right in the center of Marcus Aurelius, which had survived from antiquity. They thought it represented Constantine, so that's why the bronze survived. Around him, he projected this pavement, which is a 12-pointed stars, referring to the signs of the zodiac having a cosmological significance. And then he had this back palazzo, which had stood for a very long time, remodeled on the front. He also had this palace on the right side remodeled. There had been a structure there, but it was considerably redone according to his designs. And then to make this a more symmetrical space, he had the palace on the left side matching that on the right to inframe this piazza. Here's an overhead view from the tower of this original palazzo. You can see this large ramp that led up from the medieval city center to the center of government right on axis with the sculpture of Marcus Aurelius and the palace of the senators here at the back. Many people who visit the site note the feeling that it's almost like an interior space. It acted mostly as a stage setting for ceremonial events. The major reason Paul III wanted this renovated, for example, was that 
In 1536, he had the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V come to Rome and stage a triumph through the city. That is this triumphal procession that went through all the major parts of the city that was modeled on an ancient Roman emperor's own triumph into the city. They marched through the Forum and they were supposed to climb the Capitoline Hill up to where the Temple of Jupiter originally stood like the emperors did. But this hill was in such decay that it wasn't possible for the emperor and his entourage to ascend it. So this renovation was intended to symbolize the glories of Rome past and present. And so lots of ancient statuary, not just this Marcus Aurelius, but everything else that you see on this front balustrade, as well as this fountain ensemble back here on the Senator's Palace, all of these antiques were brought there to, to further establish the significance of the space. He had to work with what was already there, but in his designs, he unified all of these structures. So you can see that the designs of each palace is very similar. Each is two stories. There's a loggia on the bottom level on each. And he uses the giant order again here in order to unify these facades. And he does this on all three palaces. This is also a work that's not finished until after his death, following largely on his designs. And the very last part of this that's added is that pavement, which was not done during his lifetime, but instead was added in the 1900s under Mussolini. So I want to end here today with the works of Michelangelo, even though there's so many more works we could talk about. Michelangelo is a fundamental part of what's considered the high Renaissance. He had a very long career, lots and lots of works, and he was widely admired by artists and patrons all around the peninsula of Italy. He worked in several different centers. He was well connected with patrons. And even though he was kind of a curmudgeon, he didn't get along with most people, he was still the first artist to really be considered a superstar. He was called Il Divino, the divine Michelangelo, even in his lifetime. So he is perhaps, and this is saying a lot, he is perhaps the most important artist of the Renaissance. So I know we covered a lot today, but I hope you learned a great deal about Michelangelo. So thank you for watching, and I will see you for Module 7.